Hey guys, what's up and welcome back to the Rockets Hub. My name is Philip and today we are going to take a closer look at a very special vehicle from the past. The Energia Buran system, the Soviet version of the American Space Shuttle. First flown in 1988, the existence of an advanced spacecraft like the Buran in the Soviet Union surprised the Western world. It did not just look like a space shuttle, it did basically the same thing while flying fully autonomously, something the shuttle couldn't. But what the Americans thought to be the start of a new era in the Soviet space program turned out to be never repeated. The Buran remains one of the most interesting and fascinating spacecraft to ever be developed, especially for one reason. It may have been the better space shuttle. But since we are talking about the Buran today, we are not recording this video in my usual place. Instead, we are going to do it here. I am currently standing in the Technical Museum of Speyer in Germany, and luckily for us, they have got a Buran here. First plans for a usable space shuttle emerged in the United States even before the historical Apollo 11 moon landing. Funny enough, Houston actually told Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin that the Congress had passed major funding for the shuttle while they were on the moon. Unsurprisingly, the Soviets knew a lot about the space shuttle and its design. But other than the rest of the world, they didn't just see a space exploration vehicle. They thought the shuttle was developed as a weapon. Multiple aspects, like the shuttle's capability to launch, get to orbit, place or remove a satellite and land in less than two hours and work on a second launch site at Vandenberg, which would have enabled the shuttle to fly over the Soviet Union within the first orbit, led the Soviets to imagine missions beyond what NASA was planning. To match the military potential of the shuttle, the Soviet Union began development of a counterpart to the shuttle, the Energia Buran system. In 1974, Legendary propulsion engineer Valentin Glushko took over development and went on to build the first ever reusable spacecraft of the Soviet Union. The vehicle that emerged from this program closely resembled the American shuttle. Not only was the design NASA had chosen almost ideal for the tasks the shuttle was supposed to do, but the Buran had to be similar since the Soviets wanted it to match the military potential of the shuttle. On November 15, 1988, the first Buran orbiter conducted the maiden flight of the system. It lifted off from pad 1110-37 at Baikonur, completed two orbits and landed after 3 hours and 25 minutes back at Baikonur. Despite succeeding and gaining a lot of attention even in the West, the Buran never flew again. In 1989, the Soviet Union began to fall apart and the costly Buran program was put on ice until it finally got cancelled by the Russians in 1993. But before we get into the technical details of the Buran, we have to settle some naming conventions first. The orbiter itself is named the Buran, which translates to snowstorm or blizzard. But the orbiters themselves have individual names as well, and the first and only Buran to ever go to space is also called the Buran. The two other orbiters currently residing in the famous hangar at Baikonur are named Pitchka, which translates to Little Bird, and OKMT, which is only an engineering mock-up used for ground testing. The vehicle behind me is designated as OK-GLI and was an atmospheric test article similar to what the Americans did with their Enterprise test vehicle. This thing had, other than the Enterprise, got these two massive jet engines at the back that actually enabled it to take off from the ground on a runway and land back there later in the flight. Over the years, the OKGLI OK made a total of 25 atmospheric test flights, was then retired and traveled around half the globe before arriving here in Speyer. All in all, the shuttle and the Buran look very similar. Most people wouldn't even be able to tell the two apart from each other and identify the thing behind me as one of the shuttles. Oh, how wrong that would be. With a total length of 36.37 meters and a wingspan of 23.92 meters, the 
Tehran had almost exactly the same dimensions as the 32.2 by 23.8 meter space shuttle. But with a dry mass of just 62 tons, the Tehran was quite a bit lighter than the shuttle with its 78 tons. Considering the two craft were almost the same size, that's already a huge difference. But despite having a way lower dry mass, the Tehran's maximum lift of weight of 105 tons was just 5 tons lower than the shuttle's limit. That automatically leads to a huge difference in the amount of carryable payload. While the shuttle was limited to about 20 to 25 tons of payload, the Bran hadn't got any problems with 30 or above. But maybe the biggest difference can be found right here. We're at the back of the Bran now, and what you can see above me is its engine bay, or rather, the lack of one. Other than the American shuttle, the Bran did not possess the three large main engines. It only had these two maneuvering engines up there in the engine bay, the rest was empty. The actual main engines were moved from the orbiter to the center tank of the Energia rocket, eliminating weight from the Buran itself. And other than the shuttle system, the Energia featured four liquid-fueled rocket boosters instead of the two mighty SRBs the Americans used. All four boosters were powered by a four-chambered RD-170 engine each burning kerosene and liquid oxygen, delivering a total of 29 meganewtons of thrust, since the RD-170 is the most powerful engine ever developed. Combined with the Hydrolox powered core stage and its four RD-1020 engines, the Energia rocket delivered enough thrust to get Buran and its payload into low Earth orbit, meaning the orbiter itself didn't have to carry any heavy engines except the maneuvering thrusters around with it, resulting in the Buran being about 15 tons lighter than the shuttle. But putting the main engines onto the Energia carrier rocket has yet another advantage. Other than the American shuttle, the Energia didn't require that thing to be strapped onto it to get to orbit. Without the Buran on its side, the Energia could carry up to 100 tons of payload into low Earth orbit, something that no other rocket of its time could. And for once, the Energia could prove its capabilities. On May 15, 1987, the Energia rocket lifted off for the first time from Site 250 at Baikonur, carrying Polyus satellite on its side. Polyus was the largest satellite to ever be launched, an orbital weapons platform carrying a superlaser that weighed almost 80 tons. Energia performed perfectly on that day, Polyus, however, didn't. The satellite lost control during orbital insertion and crashed back down to Earth. The Energia and the Buran were two independent systems. But that isn't the only advantage the Buran had over its American counterpart. Remember what I said about the maiden flight of the Buran? There weren't any cosmonauts on board. In fact, the Buran was actually capable of autonomous flight. The Buran's maiden flight was conducted without any people on board. Although the orbiter could carry up to 10 cosmonauts, it could also fly on its own, remotely controlled from the ground. The autopilot was even capable of managing the hardest part of the flight, the landing approach from orbit and touching down on a runway. Although it was only tested once, the autopilot seemed to perform well and managed to touch down just a few meters from the program touchdown spot despite heavy crosswinds. So, the Buran was capable of both uncrewed and crewed missions. But not only that, the Soviet engineers actually made their shuttle, the Buran, quite a lot safer for their crews. The American shuttle couldn't protect their astronauts on board at all, as the tragic losses of both Columbia and Challenger demonstrated well enough. The Soviets, on the other hand, had learned from these failures and had implemented a variety of safety systems into their shuttle. At the very beginning, the US tried to implement a launch abort system into their shuttle. But in the end, they only managed to squeeze two ejection seats into a vehicle designed for a crew of up to seven or eight. And these ejection seats got dropped after the completion of Columbia, meaning only one of the five shuttles had them. And to top that, these seats were removed after only four flights due to safety concerns. The Buran, on the other hand, featured ejection seats for every crew member, so all of them could escape, not just some. 
And if that wasn't already enough, Soviet engineers had simulated over 500 individual and different abort scenarios for the Buran, so that whenever a failure would strike the Buran, it would always have an answer to it and could keep the crew perfectly safe. Additionally, the liquid-fueled boosters of the Energia rocket could always be shut down in case of emergency and the crew ejecting, rendering them safe because they wouldn't end up in the hot exhaust of the boosters. The American shuttle couldn't really do that because the SRBs it used would always burn once lit and if the crew ejected on the American shuttle, they would just end up in the fiery exhaust plumes and burn to death, which rendered the ejection seats practically useless. So, the Buran was more flexible, capable and safer than the American shuttle. But in the end, the American shuttle was a success, something that the Buran can't really state about itself. So, are there any major disadvantages the Buran might have had when compared to the American shuttle? There are only two slight disadvantages that the Buran might have had, and one of them is directly connected to its biggest strength. The lack of main engines on the orbiter means that these, the main engines are expended with every single mission of the Energia carrier rocket. Requiring new main engines for every single flight is a thing that may cause the launch cost to skyrocket. Sadly, the operating costs of the Buran aren't known, but we can assume it to be somewhere close to what the American shuttle cost. Additionally, the refurbishment operation that needed to be done between flights as the American shuttle had to go through may have further increased the cost and time effort that needed to be spent on the Buran to keep it flying. In the end, the American shuttle could afford these costs, but the Buran lacked one thing the Americans had, and that is funding. The only reason the Soviet leadership wanted the Buran in the first place was matching the military potential of the American shuttle. But when it became clear that the shuttle wouldn't be used for what the Soviets had imagined, there was simply no need for a space plane like the Buran, especially since the Soviet Union had loads of expendable vehicles that could do the same job way cheaper. So the Buran was a machine no one really needed. The Buran was born in a time of political instability. More and more protests against Soviet leadership emerged and the Soviet Union began to slowly fall apart. With a steadily declining economy and a struggle to stay alive, the Soviet Union just wasn't able to afford expensive spaceflight programs like the Buran, which led to the program being frozen and later cancelled. Maybe the biggest struggle of the Buran was the country it originated from. But even after cancellation of the Buran program, the Soviet shuttle isn't gone forever. Frankly, the opposite is the case. Its legacy can be found all over the world. Especially the engines of the Energia carrier rocket are everywhere. A slightly modified variant of the RD-170 engine, which was the one powering the four strap-on boosters, went on to be used on the first stage of the Zenit launcher and flew 84 times on this vehicle. Additionally, scaled-down versions of the RD-170 with less combustion chambers are still in use today, such as the dual-chambered RD-180 on the first stage of the Atlas V, or the single-chambered RD-181 and 91 flying on the Angara and Antares launch vehicles, although that may change following Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And of course, much of the infrastructure and test articles of the Buran is still there. Sadly, the only orbiter to ever go to space was destroyed in 2002, when the hangar it was stored in collapsed and killed 8 people in the process. But in a second hangar at Baikonur, there are Pichka, the second orbiter, an engineer mock-up and an Energia prototype left. These vehicles aren't on display, but there's loads of footage of them on the internet. Additionally, another unfinished orbiter of the second series exists, but is stored somewhere on the airport near Moscow. 
There are multiple mockups and ground test articles scattered around Russia, and one resides at Baikonur. The only brand set up for display outside of the area of the former Soviet Union is the one right behind me, here in Speyer, Germany. Despite the brand's failure, this very spacecraft is a true wonder of engineering. With limited technology and resources, in the 1980s, the Soviets still managed to produce a spacecraft that was fully functional and maybe even better than the shuttle. After all, the Bran was much more capable, flexible and safer than a shuttle and even had the capability of flying while being remotely controlled from the ground. The autonomous landing system, higher capacity and 500 individual abort scenarios were clear advancements compared to the American shuttle. The Soviets literally seemed to have learned from the Americans' failures. In the end, the Buran probably was the better shuttle, but it could never live up to its capabilities. The existential struggle of the Soviet Union and, and the resulting lack of funding prevented the Buran from having the future it may have deserved and left the world with only one shuttle. But all the people and all the engineering work that created the Soviet space shuttle shall never be forgotten. And that's it for my video about the Buran. I really hope you liked it. A huge thanks goes out, firstly, to the Technical Museum of Speyer for preserving the Buran for the generations to come. Secondly, to my friend Henry who helped me making this video possible. And of course, to every single one of you who watched until the end. We see ourselves in the next video. And until then, I'm out. Cheers.